Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out on this beautiful day. Hello, Javari. Nice to see you again. Um, glad you're back. And what may be the last beautiful day of the uh, summer. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I also wanted to thank several people for their help with this presentation. One, Kate Riley. Uh, she mentioned a book that I rely on quite uh, extensively called Catholics in the Movie by Colleen McDaniel. It's a great little book. And then um, Father Scott for helping me with the technology and continuing to help me through this <laughs> presentation in, the, in case anything goes wrong. You might want to thank him too because the alternative would have been for me to be shuffling around with my DVDs trying to figure out where the heck the uh, place was that I wanted to show you. So this I think is going to go a little more smoothly. And I'd also like to thank or blame Father Hussey for his thoughts uh, and insights into Vatican II. I've been attending his lectures at St. Agatha uh, on Sundays for the past month or so. And there's one left this Sunday, right, um, at 9.30 between the 8.30 and 11 o'clock Masses. You all are welcome to attend. Um, I think he'll talk more about what you're expecting this talk to be about. Uh, this talk was supposed to be about what happens next? What will we do after Vatican II? And I thought, well, that's interesting, but I want to talk about film and Catholicism. <laughs> so um, we're going to listen. A we're going to learn a little bit about film and Catholicism. And I'm grateful to be here. I've really learned a lot by doing this, and I I'm excited about it. Uh, there were a couple of reasons I wanted to be included in the discussion of Vatican II. The first is that I love Catholicism. I'm an unapologetic Catholic. And for those of you who are not Catholic, just bear with me. I find this faith so interesting. We have such interesting arguments, discussions, family feuds. It's probably the reason why Catholics are so filmed in the movies. We're so entertaining and we have a lot of drama going on. Really, it's worth joining just for that. Um, so if you're thinking about it, just come and see me afterwards. The second reason I wanted to include this, and some of the, some of the people I really wanted to hit with this aren't here, so just tell them I mentioned them. Um, we ignore visual culture at our peril. And I rejoice at all the um, discussions we have on this campus that focus on the written word and on books from both the present and the past. But we cannot ignore pop culture, film, and media without dire consequence. And that's why I wanted to focus on the film and the moving photographic image. The film scholar David Cook notes in his great brick of a book, it's about this big, this thick, uh, the history of narrative film. He, he explains this a little better than I can. The language of the moving photographic image has become so pervasive in our daily lives that we scarcely notice its presence. It's ubiquitous. Freshman, right? Ubiquitous. And it, yet it does surround us, sending us messages, taking positions, making statements, and constantly redefining our relationship to material reality. We can choose to live in ignorance of its operations and be manipulated by those who control it, or we can teach ourselves to read it, appreciate its very real and manifold truths, and to recognize its equally real and manifold deceptions. And we're going to see we're going to see throughout this discussion the power that film has and the concern that people have over that power. What do we do with this visual media that is so powerful and so effective? And we as Catholics, okay, here we go. Yes. And we as Catholics understand the importance of the visual. Our churches are, are, are filled with images meant to inspire, to offer comfort, and to direct, and many, many other things. So this is not unusual for us. We, we study visual images. We pray with visual images. So film is an essential component to any university curriculum. Okay, so just spread that word, okay? And it is especially important to teach 
discuss and present to students at Catholic institutions. Since the history of film and the history of Catholicism in America are really closely connected, it's uncanny how closely con connected they are. And I would like to offer several examples of how important Catholicism is to the history of American cinema before moving on to the discussion of the differences between the representation of Catholics pre-Vatican II and the representation of Catholics post-Vatican II. Surely representing religion is as old as the movies, as the movies themselves. But what is really interesting to note is that even to this day, religion in American movies is Catholic. And it's especially so in pre-Vatican II. If you're going to have a religious image in many contemporary films, the go-to religion is Catholicism. Um, Colleen McDaniel notes, rather than being marginal to American pop culture, Catholicism is central. And we'll see a couple reasons why. One, it's been around for so long, and even though the movie moguls don't believe the reason it's been around for so long, they're impressed that it's been around for so long. One of the very first American narrative films, that is a film that tells a story, was The Passion Play, a film of a German Catholic play of the final days of Christ. You see the walk, the removal from the cross, and then the train station where the, um, the walk began. It was a hit. And these are some of the stills. Of course, in the early days, Hollywood, Hollywood was considered lowbrow, not polished enough for the intellectual elite. So while movie moguls courted the intelligentsia and made films that appealed to literature, history, and other highbrow concerns, they made their money making films for the ever-increasing immigrant population. It was a match made in heaven for Hollywood. The immigrants could not speak English, and film studios were making silent films. Perfect. And many of those immigrants were Catholic, of course. As the immigrants became assimilated and more powerful and wealthier, and this was really interesting. One scholar uh, thought that prohibition, the fall of prohibition, contributed to the rise of Catholicism's credibility in American culture. Because prohibition was a predominantly Protestant move. And um, with its failure, they lost, they, thought they lost their credibility as the moral guide for America. So enter Catholics. Right? I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's, you know, but it's interesting, isn't it? I think that's an interesting idea. Further, so this vision for reform fumbled. Catholics move in to fill the religious void. And Catholics began to be seen as arbiters of morality. Further, like the Jews, they were the people who ran the vaudeville houses. One of them, the Great Southern Theater from, in Columbus, Ohio. Another, just a stock photo from New York. What happened was, was those vaudeville houses where people literally performed became Nickelodeons and Nickelodeons became movie houses. Nickelodeons, as you see as the big five there, you know, that was the charge to go to see a vaudeville show, but it was also the, show, the charge to see a film. And at the time, those films were, were usually pictures of people getting off trains, people walking to work and one scandalous one, the kiss. Um, a couple kissing, and you'd pay a nickel and you'd watch that for a short period of time. Catholics then became the biggest consumers of this new popular culture, and they became the biggest regulators of pop culture. Okay, enter, dun dun dun, Daniel Lord, Jesuit. Now, in 1930, the movie industry was suffering from a lot of bad press, a lot of immorality, fatty arbuckle trial, ooh, bad. So a lot of people were saying, we need to do something about this. We need to regulate this industry. And what they did was they created a censorship code called the Hayes Code. 
Now, it was named after a Presbyterian, the postmaster, but it was written by Daniel Lord S.J. and another Catholic layman, Martin Quigley. Okay? It was enforced until 1968, and maybe some of you remember this code, when um, in 68 we instituted the rating system that we have now. Now, the code, this is the preface to the code, and I think it's really interesting because it shows that these folks, whether you, whether you agree with the censorship or not, understood the power of this media, of this new media. They were really concerned about it and its effect on us. And I think we, we need to be a little more concerned today about how this media affects us. And listen to this. If motion pictures present stories that will affect lives for the better, they can become the most powerful force for the improvement of mankind. Wow. That's pretty, pretty high stakes there. They, filmmakers, writers, Hollywood in general, recognize their responsibility to the public because of this trust and because entertainment and art are important influences in the life of a nation. Oh, art influences nation together in one sentence? This is great, you know. So I think this is an important document to study because it shows how important this art form was to Americans at this time. Let me show you some of the rules. No picture shall be produced that will lower the moral standard of those who see it. Hence, the sympathy of the audience should never be thrown to the side of crime, wrongdoing, evil, or sin. I think that wipes out probably everything we're watching right now <laughs> no, on television or in the film. The sanctity of the institution of marriage and the home shall be upheld. Pictures shall not infer that low forms of sex relationship, and that's not a typo, that's how they refer to it, low for forms of sex relationship are the accepted or common thing. Illegal drug traffic must never be presented. And again, what, what movie would be made today? No, they do not. It was, it's been um, over since 1968. <laughs> the religion and the Hayes Code is interesting as well, and it sort of explains why some representations of Catholicism pre-Vatican you know, II are the way that they are, and post-Vatican II are the way they are. No film or episode may throw ridicule on any religious faith. Ministers of religion in their characters, ministers of religion, should not be used as comic characters or villains. Well, that's over. Um, and we'll see, we'll see that soon. Ceremonies of any definite religion should be carefully and respect, uh, respectfully handled. Okay. As a result of these, this Hague's Code requirements regarding religion, most of the pre-Vatican II representations of Catholics were regulated. Now, the, they didn't close down films. I mean, they didn't actually, you know, uh, ban films. They just couldn't be shown in movie houses. <laughs> so I think that's a great little loophole there. No, no, it's not really censorship, but you just can't show them in any movie houses, that, you know, around. There were a couple that slipped through, but for the most part, people followed these rules. Representations of the Catholic Church were respectful, and in many cases, the Catholics serve as the American religion for many reasons. One being the costumes and the hierarchy. Very dramatic stuff. People liked it. Movies such as Boy's Town, Going My Way, see, The Song of Bernadette, I Confess, The Cardinal, The Nun Story, represented the best of American Catholicism. Oh, Nun Story, we'll get to. And often, American Democracy. The leaders might end up in Europe, might become pope or cardinal or whatever, but they represented Catholicism with nods to papal authority. For the most part, Catholics in these films work for the common good and the common American good. Of course, the nun story offers a more complicated and less than idealistic portrayal, but whether or not this film is anti-Catholic or maybe a foreshadowing of Vatican II remains under debate. People still argue about this film. 
Almost coinciding with Vatican II was the presidency of America's first Catholic, John F. Kennedy. And Hollywood, as well as Americans in general, began to see the Catholic Church as less mysterious. They were less suspicious about it. It was no longer something to fear. It was now a part of American culture. And with Vatican II, the Church became more, um, less exclusive and more inclusive. At this point, I want to highlight the fact that the church does not change. <laughs> Father Hussey and I sat next to each other during Dr. Riley's first presentation, and we were encouraged to talk to one another. And we both looked at each other and said, can the church change? Is that allowed? So I think that the word change is tricky, and he mentioned in one of his uh, presentations that the word rarely appears in the Vatican II documents. And Catholics love this semantics. They love playing with these words. So let's suffice it to say that with Vatican II, the church responded to the world differently than it did during the Tridentine era. One thing is certain, though, fashions definitely adjusted. <laughs> I don't know how you got anything done in these things. Okay. <laughs> But in all seriousness, Vatican II made some significant adjustments to the relationship between Catholicism and the, and the world. Okay, da, 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 Vatican II, is that right? Okay, and now some of the changes. More inclusive, not exclusive, participatory, not reclusive, emphasis on social justice, emphasis on the laity, less corporate, more communal. Um, and one of the noticeable ways that we re reflected this change was the de-emphasis on the habit. Catholic religious were not separate people, they were part of the people. And um, lay people were, and I'm repeating myself here, perhaps more than anywhere else, the shift from the Tridentine Church to the Vatican II Church is most apparent in the lives and the work of the female religious. While Vatican, coinc Vatican II coincided with Camelot, it also coincided with da, 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 the women's liberation movement in America, um, the second wave of feminism, and this continues to be a point of tension in the church. In Hollywood, however, the shift is really apparent. Pre-Vatican II films, like pre-1970 feminist films, emphasize female obedience and patriarchal roles. For example, let's take a look at one of the most popular films of 1945, riding off the great popularity of Going My Way, Bells of St. Mary brings back Bing Crosby with, this time, Ingrid Bergman. And let's hope this works. Oh, and I'm going to have to put this here. And...
Didn't have had a chance like that in years. I had to try. Let me find my place here. The stars are, of course, one of the reasons for the film's popularity. How could you not like Bing Crosby and Ingrid Bergman? Um, the Catholic audience was strong. The film was a big hit among Catholics and non-Catholics. And there is a lot of comedy in, the, in this film. It is really funny. If you haven't seen it in a while, you need to review it. And if you've never seen it, you need to watch it. This is this young green priest coming into this school of sisters, established sisters who've been teaching since, you know, he was born and they know what they're doing and he doesn't. And there's a lot of comedy between these, you know, the battle between these two groups. And the women seem pretty powerful, you know, in this. And even the Irish housekeeper says, oh, you better be careful with the sisters. The last priest they carted off to, you know, shady breast. He couldn't, ta he couldn't take it, you know, and stuff. And there's this great scene when he's giving the big speech. You know, he's this young guy. He's coming in, okay, I'm going to be the priest. I'm going to lead the way. And he's giving this very serious pr this message. And there's a little cat behind him with his hat. And the cat has the hat on, and the sisters are laughing hysterically. And this poor guy has no idea what's going on. But ultimately, Bing is the center of attention. And you see it here. In film theory, we look at where camera angles go. Okay? That says a lot to us about people, their power, and what happens to us almost unconsciously. You see with Ingrid Bergman, great star that she is, she's in soft focus, she looks great, but the camera is always at high angle, always looking down at her. And even this, um, we well, can't see it now, but even the, the, the tableau, he is looking down at her, and so she is beneath him. He, on the other hand, is the medium shot. Just from the torso to the top of his head, he's one of us. He's on our level. So, you know, the film is communicating power relationships. And throughout the film, the women never leave the building. He's the only one that gets to go out. They watch him through windows. They watch him through doorways. Okay? Um, oh, where was I here? So Father O'Malley makes the changes and encourages the women to loosen up a bit. Um, the women remain in the traditional roles, taking care of the kids, and while it's incre he's incredibly likable, the film has, you know, he has the last word. And this is true in many films prior to the feminist movement of the 1970s, Catholic representation or no. You know, women stayed at home, the men went out. Following Vatican II, and perhaps, you know, coinciding, maybe Vatican II led this. I mean, that's what I'm thinking. It's like, wow, Vatican II was really ahead of a lot of major movements, the anti-war movement, the feminist movement, you know, just starting us thinking about things a little differently. But anyway, after this time, many representations of female religious changed. They become more independent and feisty. They always had moxie, to use um, Dr. Riley's word. But now they were sometimes in direct conflict, not only with popular culture, but church hierarchy. In Dead Man Walking, for example, we learn about the real-life work of Sister Helen Prejean, and we were lucky enough to have her speak here a couple years ago. She befriends... Um, Matthew Consolette, a death row inmate, and guides him to his execution, all the while fighting for his life, but also fighting with this priest who's, you know, giving her a hard time about going into the prisons. Now, one of the clips I wanted to show you didn't work out. It was an old, old copy that I had. And in that clip, the priest who wa watches over the, you know, I, I guess the prison is in his parish. He's not actually in the prison. Says, first thing he says to her is, why aren't you in the habit? She's like, we haven't worn a habit in 20 years, Father, you know. And, well, you know, and she says, you know, the Pope said we should be distinct. We don't have to be in a habit. And he gives her a hard time the whole way. In this scene, she has requested to be uh, this young man's spiritual advisor before he's about to die. And we'll see the um, priest response to that. So... You've put in a request to be the spiritual advisor to Matthew Ponsolet. Yes, Father. Why? He asked me. This is highly unusual. Why? Well, you would be the first woman to do it. Really? This kind of situation requires an experienced hand. This boy is to be executed in six days. 
and is in dire need of redemption. Are you up to this? I don't know, Father. I hope so. I, I've been praying for guidance. You can save this boy by getting him to receive the sacraments of the church before he dies. This is your job. Nothing more, nothing less. If you need any help, please feel free to call on me. Thank you, Father. Bam, try dentine Catholicism right there. What is, his, what is her job? Get those sacraments to him. Get those sacraments to him. That's the, that's the you know, pri priority there. But I think in the next scene, we see the spirit of Vatican II really working. God knows the truth about me. I'm going to a better place. I'm not worried about nothing. You all right? Yes. I'm okay. Christ is here. I don't worry about anything. Okay. Look, I want the last thing you see in this world to be a face of love. Yes, ma'am. Time to go, Ponsolet. Can she stay home and touch me? Yes, she may. Dead man walking. That's so powerful. I think that's very powerful. We see the revisions of Vatican II very clearly here. Look at me, see the face of love, see Christ through me. Sacraments or no, Prejean offers salvation to this young man and serves as a face of Christ to him in his final moments. The adjustments brought about by Vatican II paralleled the adjustments going on in Hollywood. By 1968, the movie rating system replaced the Hayes Code, and though there were still battles over decency and there were still Catholic papers, like my universe bulletin that I grew up with in Cleveland, you know, condemning films, which basically told us the films that we wanted to see. Um, anyway, <laughs> and which we did see, you know, behind our parents' backs. Um, film regulation had relaxed. One of the most memorable representations, and don't worry, I'm not going to show this to you, I'm just going to show you a picture, um, is The Exorcist in 1973. Could never have been made with, under the Hayes Code. Um, but despite its emphasis on a rarely practiced ritual and its, you know, gore, um, it does represent Catholicism in an extremely positive way. If you watch any horror movies, and I'm a big horror fan, you know to call a priest. You don't call. A, you don't call a medium. You don't call a, um, you know, a, a, a witch doctor. You call a priest when you're dealing with the devil. But the priests in this movie were incredib are presented incredibly as incredibly intelligent, reluctant to have anything to do with this ritual, and they do not enter it lightly. They are human. The young priest struggles with his own faith and his guilt over his mother's death, but perhaps more than the script itself, the casting of Max von Sydow as the exorcist probably helped present Catholicism in a positive way. Siddow, of course, starred in the classic Bergman film, The Seventh Seal, which is a Catholic allegory for humanity's pilgrimage on earth and death we must all face. In the end, the Catholic Church triumphs in both of these films, and audiences are given a more balanced view of Roman Catholicism, one that is, according to The Exorcist, apparently powerful enough to take on the forces of evil, even in the modern world. One of the issues that occurred to me throughout these discussions, too, is the use of um, sacramentals. 
while there was some de-emphasizing you know, de on it, we could not get rid of them. As a matter of fact, I was reminded, Henry VIII and Elizabeth I, great Protestant uh, figures, still used Catholic sacramentals, such as prayer books and rosaries. It was very hard for them to give those up. In a great film by Alfred Hitchcock called The Wrong Man, Hitchcock tries his hand at documentary. This film is inspired by uh, the real life story of Manny Balistrero, and Hitchcock was inspired by the Italian doc documentaries going on in the 1940s. So he went back to the black and white, even though it's 1956, because he wanted to try his hand at this Italian art form. Played by Henry Fonda, Manny comes from a devout Catholic Italian family a family that represents the kind of Catholic families that, and neighborhoods that many of us grew up in. Manny is a first-generation American. He's a musician who plays late nights, is devoted to his family, struggling to make ends meet. He's an everyman, and we like him. He's being unjustly accused in this film. Now, before I go into the film, Hitchcock's relationship to Catholicism is characterized by his relationship to Hollywood, ambivalent at best. Though one of the great, greatest directors ever, he never won an Oscar, and though raised Catholic and educated by Jesuits, and a very generous contributor not only to his alma mater, St. Ignatius, in England, but also various chapels and churches in California, he denied he would not identify himself as a Catholic filmmaker. And he always ran into trouble with the censors. There we have his picture here. Uh, one of the most famous examples is his first film, Rebecca. Based on the Daphne du Maurier novel of the same name, it's a story about a new bride who's dealing with the memory of her deceased predecessor, Rebecca. To make matters more difficult, Rebecca's maid, Mrs. Danvers, has an unusual attachment, one that Hitchcock hoped to emphasize. David Oselznik, the producer, said, no way. We're making another Gone with the Wind, and we're not going to have any suggestion that Mrs. Danvers and Rebecca, you know, anything about that. So Hitchcock, who became notorious for sneaking inescapable inferences, got around the problem with camera shots and a discussion about underwear between um, the new Mrs. De Winters and Mrs. Danvers. Um, and he's notorious for that, just trying to just push it envelope there. And I think, yeah, anyway. To return to the wrong man, Hitchcock, I think, addresses Catholic matters head on. Um, the wrong man represents the, uh, the American Tridentine Church nicely, but it also represents the changes that are about to come, and it's a, play, a film that you probably haven't seen. In this scene, Manny is at his wit's end. He has been to, to trial. They've had to throw it out because of a juror misconduct issue. His wife has suffered a mental breakdown because of this, and Manny is desperate. He is desperate. And here he is talking to his mother. I think I could have stood him better if they'd found me guilty. It's like being put through a meat grinder. Once this isn't enough, they've got to do it to you again. Myself, oh, I've been such an idiot. You'd all be better off without me. None of it is your fault, Manny. You've just had a lot of bad breaks that can happen to anybody. Yeah, what can I do? Have you prayed? Yes. What did you pray for? I prayed for help. Pray for strength, Manny. I don't see how anything can help if I don't get some luck. Somebody committed those holdups. Where is he? Maybe in jail already for some other crime in some other state. Maybe well, you'll never be suspected for anything he committed in our neighborhood. My son, I beg you to pray. Got to go to work.
I'm going to show the um, when he's apprehended because there's this little Italian woman in here who's so cute. <laughs> I do like her. Pound of ham, please. Sorry. What's that? This is a gun. Give me the money from the cash drawer. What money? <laughs> Don't mess. Don't Temper, mess. lady. Temper. That won't do you any good. Don't you come near me. Keep back. I never did this before. Let me go. I got kids. I didn't hurt anybody. Let me go. Police? I didn't hurt anybody. We have a guy here. Try to hold up the store. Yeah. We can hold him. Okay, you don't mess with those uh, store owners. Um, so this is the simple faith that many of us grew up with. He, and he does use the rosary during many of the uh, trial scenes. What's interesting here is the mother, not a priest, encourages his advice. But that, that meditation on the image of Christ on the wall is very... Uh, you know, familiar to Catholics. And even in medieval times, there's a document called the Ancrin and Wiss. It's a document to help anchorites study. And one of the things they're encouraged to do is to imagine themselves crawling into the wounds of Christ to have a spiritual, greater understanding of Christ's suffering and death. So this is, is really classic use of visual image for um, Catholicism. And I'm still not sure where I stand with this film. Is it a pre-Vatican II or is it a post-Vatican II? I'm still working that out. In a more recent film, and this will be the last one I look at, The Way by Emilio Estevez, we see another lay person struggling with the challenges of life. In the film, a young man is killed while walking the way of St. James, a 500-mile walk that has been attracting pilgrims since the Middle Ages. As we will learn, everyone walks the Camino del Santiago for different reasons, but this young man is doing it because he wants to experience life. He's sick of studying for his doctorate, and, he wa and his mother's recent death just spurs him to get out and see the world. Unfortunately, he's killed through a freak accident, and his father, Tom, a very comfortable middle-class man, must travel to Fran France to pick up the body. Tom is an ophthalmologist who helps many see, but of course is blind to his own needs and his spiritual life. As he goes through his son's things, he decides he will walk the way with his son's ashes. Along the way, he meets several other pilgrims. Sarah, who is supposedly walking the path to quit smoking, but we later found out, find out that she is dealing with her feelings about an abortion she had. Then there is Juiced, who is supposedly walking to lose weight. Jack, an Irish writer with, Ir with writer's block. As they work their way to Spain and the Church of St. James, we learn that all are human and all forgive one another. Tom, too, meets a priest along the way. And let's look at this clip. Hey, I'm Frank, New York. Tom, California. Nice to meet you, Rabbi. Oh, actually, I'm a priest. <laughs> well, you can understand my confusion. Yeah, a lot of people make that mistake. Brain cancer. Surgery left me with a terrible scar. I wear this yarmulke to cover it up. They didn't get it all, you know. Cancer. Mm. Said it'll probably come back. Who knows about these kind of things? Only God. Anyway, they say that miracles happen out here on the Camino de Santiago. You believe in miracles, Father? I'm a priest. It's kind of my job. You're Catholic. I don't practice anymore. You know, Mass at Christmas, Easter, that's about it. Here, take this. No, I can't take your Oh, no, please, Father. take it. A lot of lapsed Catholics out here on the Camino, kid. Besides... 
Thank you. Vengan peregrinos, bienvenidos. Vengan, vengan, peregrinos, bienvenidos. Water, there is no road, only the way of the sea. Viva Carlo! Viva Portugal! I'm going to try this. Okay. The priest is wearing a yarmulke, but he offers Tom a rosary, and later Tom admits that it came in handy. The way, the walk, the people, the sacramentals are all necessary to Tom's spiritual awakening, an awakening that leads him to leave his comfortable life in California and inspires him to see the world, to become a pilgrim. And I guess the biggest contrast between that film and The Bells of St. Mary's is how messy the way is and how messy post-Vatican II is. <laughs> There's something nice about pre-Vatican II. You had your rules, you had your prayer books, and now it's not as simple sometimes. And I guess that's one of the biggest differences that I see in both the films and the church. With Vatican II, the church becomes less mysterious. It's out in the world, not behind a wall, and there are films that still do that, the Vinci Code, things like that, but most of the time, they don't. Ironically, the lack of the habit makes Catholicism tough for uh, Hollywood. Hollywood liked having the clothes. They like having that one you know, shot and saying, oh, priest, okay. Um, there's no stereotypical image to represent faith or religion. And without the Hays Code, we get films like Sister Act or Nacho Libre or whatever about a monk who wants to be a wrestler. But overall, the Roman Catholic Church has fared pretty well in the movies. There are exceptions, of course, but overall, Hollywood appreciates our faith, both before and after Vatican II, and I imagine that Catholicism will continue to appear in movies in positive ways. Greater Glory, for example, opened this summer. It's a film about the Catholic uprising against an atheistic Mexican government. It, like many matters in our church, caused controversy, but as I said in the beginning, this is what the conflict that makes our faith so great so interesting and so movie worthy. And Vatican II, I think we can learn a lot from Hollywood when approaching Vatican II. We want to be popular, we want to be helpful and part of the world, we want good box office sales, but at the same time we want to be distinct, we want to be different, and I think that's a challenge for us. This is one of the tensions that persists following Vatican II. But I think the way offers the best image for our contemporary post-Vatican II church. We are a pilgrim church, a church that does not necessarily change, but, change, but certainly keeps moving. And so there are adjustments, movements, and a dynamism to our faith that, we, that neither we nor Hollywood can fully understand or represent. So there's always room for a sequel to be continued. Thank you.